on, OC, let's go. But we're in the book of Matthew, and Matthew was a tax collector uh, that became a disciple. And I just love that, 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 that Jesus called um, a ragtag bunch. Um, it's just beautiful, beautiful picture for all of us uh, that are following Jesus. And uh, he's a Jew, and his particular readership is Jewish. He's trying to show the Jews that Jesus, Jesus truly is the Messiah King that they've been waiting for. And that's kind of the context of this particular book. Uh, but today we're going to be in, in Matthew uh, chapter 18, verses 21 through 35. And uh, I just want to, right on the front here, I want to read just a couple verses and then we're going to pray. Let's go to the Word of God. Anybody thankful for the Word of God? Are you there? Matthew chapter 18. You got your Bible, your e-Bible, whatever it is. Here we go. Verse 21. This is a section of scripture where the disciples are asking Jesus some questions. And Peter comes to the Lord and he says this, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Have you ever asked that question before? Seven times? Jesus looks at him and says, no, not seven times, but 70 times seven. If you're a note taker, you can write down the title of today's message. You ready for it? Done keeping score. How to forgive when you don't want to. Some of y'all ready to just walk up right out of here right now. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you that it's alive, it's active, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And we just pray even now, as we lean into the idea of forgiveness and the standard in which you set, I just pray for each heart. I pray even right now that your Holy Spirit would soften our hearts. Lord, that we would get your heart for this particular area. And I just believe, God, that we're seeing in these last days, the enemy takes so much ground through offense. And I believe today, God, you're putting, you're putting some of those enemies on, a, on an eviction notice today. We're just declaring that in the house of God today. We declare freedom in this place today. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. amen. Uh, well, I grew up not liking math all too much. Anybody else in here? Glad I'm not alone. So thankful that they made calculators. But I'm even more thankful that they put calculators on our phones. That way I don't have to carry around a Texas instrument calculator in my pocket. Yeah, I'm that dude. I'm that guy, you know, that goes out with friends to dinner, gets the bill. Hey, hey my man's laughing because he does the same thing. Just sneak that calculator out so I can, you know, tally up what the tip's going to be. I told you, I'm not all too good at math here. Anybody love math in here? Anybody love math? Where are all my math lovers? God bless you all. My goodness. You know, when I think about uh, this idea of math, it's, it's interesting and funny is, you know, you don't have to be a mathematician or really good with numbers to keep score on a fence. Anybody with me today? It got real quiet in here for a moment. I'm a former Catholic, so come on, you're making me nervous. Help me out today. You got to talk to me during this sermon. But it's interesting how, you know, we can recollect uh, those who have offended us from our past. All of a sudden, we, we just get real good at numbers. You know, I was thinking about this. I... I use this, uh, this app called Every Dollar, and I use it to track my expenses. And uh, you know, if, you, if you're not using something, you, you probably should, especially if you're not good at math. You need a budget, and I track my expenses, and as I was preparing, I was thinking, man, you know, there, there's an app that we can't download, but it kind of lives in our mind. It's called the Every Offense app. 
You know, we just, in the same way that I'm tracking my expenses, it's like I'm tracking offenses over the years. You know, it's like, isn't it interesting? I'm not good with numbers, but I can remember back in 2003, Mom and dad missed my ball game. We won 14 to 10. They missed it because they were out partying. I mean, that's not really my story, but some, somebody in here, you, you, you remember those numbers. You're not so good at math, but you remember that. Or you remember when your best friend stole your girlfriend. Hello. Have you checked her out on the gram recently, by the way? She's crazy. You ought to thank your friend. Because the girl to your right is much better. Come on, make some noise in here today. Or how about, you know, this is a real, this is a real, real thing for me. I remember one of my best friends um, getting married. Had no idea he was getting married until I opened my phone one day. Got on Instagram. All of a sudden, boom, you're like, oh, snap, I didn't get the invite. Maybe you can't relate to, to any of those particular examples, but I think it's interesting that, you know, we all experience offense. And I say this, that offense is natural, but staying offended is negligent. And so I just, you know, I think it's interesting because as we look at this text in Matthew chapter 18, we see that Jesus is establishing a new standard for forgiveness. It's interesting because Peter here, now Peter was a character, so when I read this, I'd probably probably draw outside the lines a little bit, but Peter was an absolute character. Is anybody with me? So it's funny because he's like, Jesus, how many times do I need to forgive a brother that sins against me? You know, he's probably asking because he's got a brother that's sinned against him like six times, and he's just over it. He's like, just let me off the hook seven times. And he actually thought he was being spiritual because the rabbis of that day said that you needed to forgive how many times? Three. So he was up in the ante. And Jesus comes back and says seven times 70. Now I'm picturing Peter. He's probably like getting his calculator out like, what? Or at least pausing for a second and trying to do the math on that. But I think about this particular standard that Jesus was setting. And I think that you can write it down like this. Here's what Jesus was really saying, is forgiveness is not about keeping score, it's about losing count. Forgiveness is not about keeping score, tallying up the offenses, it's about losing count. He says seven times 70, which equals 490. Yes, I used the calculator. Do you really think that you're going to continue to keep count at 475 and 476? Jesus was using a figure of speech here. He's saying, no, I wanna see a pattern of forgiveness in your life. Forgiveness is not about keeping score. It's about losing count. And it's interesting because Paul confirms this In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses four and five, when he's talking about love. I think this is so interesting because if we really get down to the key and the crux of forgiveness, it's it's love. Some of you have been rebuking the enemy when the most spiritual warfare you can commit against unforgiveness is forgiveness. It's walking in love. 1 Corinthians 13 lays it out. Check this out. It says this, love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. And here it is, write this down. It keeps no record of being wrong. Love doesn't keep score. It doesn't keep score. It keeps no record of wrong. Some of us need to delete the offense app that lives between our two ears. We need to throw that thing out today. We need to get it out of here. Because I came in this house today to declare freedom in this place. As a matter of fact, there are some of you that are experiencing, that have experienced years, 
years of frustration, years of feeling stuck, years of sickness and disease, and it all goes back to an offense that you've held on to for years. But today we declare in the house of God that you will be set free. You will be set free. Now Jesus, as we look at this uh, particular passage of scripture, he doesn't stop um, with giving this number, but he goes on to tell a parable to bring a little bit more context. Do you wanna hear the parable? Because I think the parable preaches for itself. It's such a great picture for you and I. He says this, he goes on in verse 23 of chapter 18. He says, therefore the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. He couldn't pay, so his master ordered that he be sold along with his wife his children, everything he owned to pay the debt. Let me just tell you, this guy was not, not in a good situation. I mean, think about that. You owe this debt, you can imagine the pressure and the weight of that. Secondarily, you know you can't pay the debt, and as a result, your wife, your children are gonna suffer um, because of your doing. So what does he do? I think what a lot of us would do. It says this in verse 26, but the man fell down before his master and begged him, now, I want you to pay attention to what he says here. I want you to circle this, underline this. We're gonna come back to it. He says this, please be patient with me and I will pay it all. Verse 27, then his master was filled with pity for him and he released him and forgave his debt. Man, this guy just won, didn't he? He got a good deal. Somebody say good deal. Good deal. Verse 28, but when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. You read this and you're like, what, what, what are you doing, man? Verse 29, his fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Be patient with me and I will pay it. Same thing that he said to the king. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. Verse 31, when some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king and told him everything that happened. Then the king called in the man he had forgiven and said, you evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid the entire debt. That's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. Wow. Come on. There are some verses of scripture I don't like reading. And that's one of them. Can't we just take that one out, Jesus? Did you have to say it like that? That's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. Now it's interesting, because when I read this parable and when you read this parable, I'm, I'm sure you're asking questions, right? Like, wait a second, help me understand. This man owed millions of dollars and the king let him go. Why is he going and choking out a man that owes him a couple thousand dollars? Like, I can't quite wrap my mind around how he gets to that space and place. But, but as I, I got a fresh revelation this time going through this text that I've just never seen before, I told you to mark it. In verse 26, I think we get, an, uh, we get the picture as to why this man was stuck in deception. Remember, he's got this debt on his life and he's crying out to the king and here's what he says to him. Please be patient with me and I will pay it all. So, so here's what I want us to understand today is he, this man was forgiven of a debt that he thought he could pay off with more time. Let this sink in for a second because I think this is how a lot of us operate with God. We're, we're trying to pay off the debt on our life of sin 
with good works, with just a little bit more good works, with just a little bit more time and I'll get over this addiction. With just a little bit more time, I'll experience some freedom. As I just move further and further away from the hurt, it'll be all good. But I came in here to declare today, this man was delivered of his debt, but not his deception. He was delivered of his penalty, but not his pride. You have to get this in your spirit today because he left this situation having been let off the hook, but he didn't catch the revelation of what had happened, so he couldn't give away what he never received. The king let him go, but he never got the revelation. And this is what happens to you and I. I don't know about you, but all week long, I've just been thinking about putting myself in the shoes of this man. He owes millions of dollars. You know, I think about the picture that this is for you and I. That it doesn't matter if you're an amateur sinner or a pro sinner. Here's what I know. The Bible says that sin separates you and I from a holy God. And that creates a big problem. Because the very reason why I was created was for a love relationship with my creator. But because of my sin, because of the debt on my life, I'm separated from relationship with the only one who will satisfy, with the only one who will fulfill. And this is a problem. It's a problem. And I think it's interesting because we'll talk about this a little bit later. But Jesus is put on the cross to pay our debt, to pay our penalty. He was without sin, and he paid the price for you and I. And I don't know about you, but that humbles me. That softens my heart. That makes me weep over my rebellion and my rejection for so many years. It causes gratitude to erupt in my heart. Is anybody with me? This grace that I didn't deserve. He set me free. He who knew no sin became sin so that you and I might become the righteousness of God. This is what our Savior did for us. And the beautiful thing is, is he forgave you and I before we ever said sorry. I want you to get a revelation today of him hanging on the cross right now. In the words that came out of his mouth before any of us repented, is Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. He not only sets the standard for forgiveness, but he operated in it. He walked it out for you and I. He modeled it. And I don't know about you and I, but there are people, some of you walked in here today, and Jesus forgave you 2,000 years ago when he was on that cross, but today you're going to be reconciled. And you and I are reconciled to Jesus when we repent. And today you're going to recognize that you've been just trying to figure this thing out in your own strength trying to do it in your own good works, just kind of waiting for time to pass. Let me just tell you, Jesus set a new standard. And you can't achieve it on your own strength. And there's just something that happens in each of us when we, when we pause and we, we think about this particular uh, passage and this, this situation. It reminds me of 2 Corinthians 7.10 that says, for godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. You know, and that's what's interesting is we've got to think about this. There's a difference between feeling remorse, feeling like this weight, feeling the conviction of our sin versus feeling the weight and the conviction because we got caught. Two different things. And that's why I think that this man never caught the revelation because scholars say, submit that he was probably stealing some money from the king, which is why he owed this massive debt. The question I'm asking, and was was he ever really convicted of the sin he committed or was he just, you know, convicted because he got caught? We see the fruit of what comes from this. You know, in Luke 17, uh, chapter one, Jesus said this. He says, it it is impossible, but that offense will come. So you and I will experience offense. And I really believe this, that, that offense is the bait of Satan, especially in this hour. We know this, that the enemy comes to what? Still kill and destroy. 
And one of the main strategies that he uses to accomplish this is unforgiveness. It's interesting because when you look up the word, the word offense in the Greek, the word is scandalon. Now, when you look at this word, I think it's interesting. What this word means is a trigger of a trap in which bait is placed so hunters can trap animals. So when an animal touches the bait, the trap catches the animal. When you and I hold on to offense and unforgiveness, we are eating the bait and we become trapped by the enemy who wants to ensnare us. Now, some of you are thinking, but oh, see, you don't know what they did to me. Don't I have the right to be offended for what was done to me? Don't I have the right, OC? Yes, you do have the right to be offended. You have the right to do anything. You have the right to go to hell and burn in a lake of fire, and God will protect your right if that's what you choose. But if you want to walk in the presence of God, in the blessing of God, you do not have the right to be offended. He's called us to something different. Being offended is natural, but staying offended is negligent. And here's what I want to tell somebody today. Clinging to your offense carries consequences. Your trauma will become your entanglement. What you tolerate will be transferred to the next generation. I just think about the prison that it puts us in. You know, offense is like offense. Yeah. <laughs> offense is like offense. And a filter. Some of us have got so comfortable in our fence that we've just taken a seat. You camped out in a valley that God was asking you to pass through. And you're sitting in your own prison. You're the one that's enslaved. And here's what's interesting is there's only so much connection and intimacy that you can experience here. Now, I, need to, I need to illustrate this, and so I'm gonna ask Cap to come up here, a friend, because there's a lot of different relationships that we experience that we can't experience offense from. You know, some of you right now, and I want you to even just be thinking about it. Maybe it's your spouse sitting to your right or to your left. Maybe, maybe it's a parent. Maybe it's a friend, a coworker. I mean, I don't know what the, re the relational connection looks like. This is one of my best friends. Backyard neighbors. Now, the reality is, 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 is man, God longs for he and I to be taking ground, moving the kingdom of God forward shoulder to shoulder. Like, look at this picture. Look at this picture. Look at this picture. Okay. Now, come on the other side. Offense becomes offense. I. <laughs> but some of y'all are living in your marriage like this. And you're wondering why you feel disconnected. Try to give me a hug right now, bro. <laughs> Ain't going to work. Go sit down and give this guy some 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 dap, man. Thank you, bro. Do you see the picture? Do you see why this should matter? Now, there's not just spiritual implications to this word that I'm trying to deliver today, but I read this article, and I just want to read this to you. I think it's really interesting. It says this. This was an article by Dr. Michael Berry, and it says this, quote, of all cancer patients, 61% have forgiveness issues. And of those, more than half are severe, according to the research by Dr. Michael Berry, a pastor and an author of the book, The Forgiveness Project. Quote, harboring, harboring these negative emotions, this anger and hatred creates a state of chronic anxiety. Chronic anxiety very predictably produces 
excess adrenaline and cortisol, which deplete the production of natural killer cells, which is your body's foot soldier in the fight against cancer. When a person forgives from the heart, which is the standard we see in Matthew 18, forgiveness from the heart, we find that they are able to find a sense of peacefulness. Quite often our patients refer to that as a feeling of lightness, he said. Barry said most people don't realize what a burden anger and hatred were until they let them go. So it's interesting because even in this place today, there are some of you that have had physical ailment that is actually tied back to unforgiveness in your life. And I, be- I just believe this today. There are gonna be people that are healed, saved, and delivered today in the house of God. It's gonna happen. So I think it's interesting that we've, we've gotten this far in the message. There's so much that I feel like I could unpack here, but I've only got a few moments. God has just been giving me so much revelation um, for this particular topic. And I, th- I find it interesting. You know, I was, I, my wife and I were laughing about this. And uh, as a matter of fact, I was printing off my notes last night in, in the bedroom. And she was kind of playing with me, joking around and kind of pushing my laptop like three quarters closed. And I was like, babe, come on. I'm like, try- there's a word I'm trying to get typed out here. And she's like, well, you're gonna forgive me anyway. <laughs> I was like, that's so good. But this week has been crazy. I'm like, Lord, don't ask me to preach on forgiveness because it just felt like I've had to just take care of my heart like on a whole new level this week. Is anybody with me? Taking care of the heart is like a full-time job. It really is. That's why the Bible says keep your heart with all diligence for it determines the course of your life. Some of you are going down the wrong course because you forgot to take care of your heart. Full-time job, baby. Allow the Holy Spirit to do the work in you. And so some of you are thinking, well, how do I know if I really need to forgive somebody? Here, I'm just gonna give you these. I just wrote down a few tip-offs. When the person calls, you ignore it. When they text you, you barely wanna text back. Irritability is a tip-off. Passive aggressiveness is a tip-off. Anger is a tip-off. Jealousy is a tip-off. I want you to think about some of these. There's many more that I could give you, but I want you to think about that right now in regards to certain relationships that you have in your life. Because the reality, the the question that we should be asking today is who needs forgiven? Who needs forgiven? Like it's great to just read the parable and understand the new standard and all that, but how are we gonna apply it to our life? Who needs to be forgiven in your life? Now the second question that we should be asking is why should I forgive? Anybody asking that? Why should I forgive? You can write this down, number one, forgive because you've been forgiven. It said it right there, Matthew 18, 33. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? A person who can't forgive is a person who has forgotten what they've been forgiven of. Paul says this in Ephesians 4, 32. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, Forgiving one another just as God through Christ has forgiven you. We should forgive because we've been forgiven. Number two is we should forgive so Satan can't imprison us. It's funny because I love when the when the door to door salesmen come creeping through the neighborhood. And um, recently uh, we had we had some guys coming through the neighborhood trying to sell me on the new Verizon Internet. These were some kind dudes, some good dudes. I, and I like striking up conversation. But I, I was pulling into my drive, into my garage, and uh, I was getting out of my car, and they kind of walked up on my sidewalk. Hey, sir, hey. You know, they got my attention, and I, I, was, I was willing to give them a, a little bit of time. I was willing to give them an inch. And when you give them an inch, they're going to take a mile. Anybody with me? And the conversation that began on the driveway all of a sudden started creeping into the garage. Next thing you know, I'm standing by the back of my car in my garage having a conversation about Verizon Internet. They about got me to sign the line right there. I'm telling you, they were good at their job. Now, if you're in door-to-door sales, um, we love you. This is not shade on you. I just think it's a great picture of how the enemy tries to enter into our hearts and minds. 
We give him an inch, yeah. he takes a mile. He's looking for an entryway to kill, steal, and destroy. That is his mission on your life. Ephesians 4, 26 and 27 says this, and don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry for anger, here it is, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. Now, why does the enemy want a foothold? Because a foothold turns into a stronghold. He wants a foothold. And I, I wrote this down in my notes. I'm calling this the torture cycle. Write this down, because some of you are in this right now. This is, this is what the enemy does. I call this the torture cycle. Step one, he tempts you to hold on to an offense, tries to get the foothold. Then, once you do, he condemns and tortures you for holding on to that. Remember, offense becomes a wide open door. So if you wanna cut off spiritual attack in your life, walk in forgiveness. So we open the door, he comes in, he begins condemning us and torturing us. The torture produces pain in our heart, which then we move to step three. Then the enemy tempts you to act out in a way that numbs the pain. So here you are, you open the door to offense, and next thing you know, now you're running to substance abuse to cover up the pain that you're feeling in your heart and in your soul. And then step four is this, he condemns and tortures you for that. It's just like he's taking your nose and rubbing it in the dirt and pressing you down to kill, steal, and destroy your life. So why should we forgive? So that he can't imprison us, so that he can't do this. And here's what's interesting is Jesus teaches about this being a sign of the end times in Matthew 24. I wanna go into this deeper, but he says this in 10, and then many will be offended will betray one another, and will hate one another. Isn't that what we're experiencing in culture? Yep. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Here's what's interesting. This isn't just happening in the world. It's happening in the church. Yep. This is happening in the church of Jesus Christ. This is happening in the church, and it should break our heart. Yes, sir. We see right here the the pattern of the enemy starts with offense and then moves to betrayal, and eventually we find ourselves in hatred. Yep. You know, hate in the Greek actually means loveless. Isn't that interesting? Now, if you go on to read in that passage, I don't have it, but in verse 11, it talks about how, about how an offended heart is the breeding ground for deception. And here's what's interesting about deception. The person who is deceived believes with all their heart that they are right when they are wrong. That's a scary place to be, church. Proverbs 18, 19 says this, that a brother offended is harder to win than a strong city. You need to write this down because the writer of this is Solomon. What is he talking about? An offended brother is harder to win than a strong city. What is he writing? Well, cities back in that day had what around the city? Walls. What he's saying is an offended brother is harder to win than a strong city that has walls up around it. What a, what a picture, right? A fence is the fence. We can't give the enemy any room in our life. I heard a story uh, this week because what we need to understand about our offense this would be the third reason why we should forgive is because your unforgiveness pollutes others. He says it in Hebrews uh, chapter 12, watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. I say it like this, betrayal is what people do to you. Bitterness is what you do to yourself. What did I tell you? What's tolerated will be transferred. You can't dress up a toxic root system. So we've got to walk in the opposite spirit. I heard the story of this woman who was sexually abused by her father and in her older years, as her parents were growing older, she felt like the Holy Spirit whispered to her that she was supposed to like take care of them in their older age. The problem was they lived in a different city. So she called up her parents and she said, hey, I wanna move you closer to us 
so that I can take care of you and I feel like I'm supposed to buy you guys a house. Now, when she's telling the story, she's saying, I didn't wanna buy him a house, I wanted to put him in a trailer. Like this was, this was not easy for her, but this was her worship. This was her warfare. To love her parents despite their love for her, despite the harm that they created to her. So she does it reluctantly, but she does it out of obedience. Not because she feels it, but because she knows God's commanding her to do it. She moves her parents to town and she's taking care of them and three years passes by. It's the middle of the week and she gets a phone call from her father and her father's in tears and says, hey, will you come over? I wanna to talk to you. She gets over there and the father's weeping and crying, saying, I can't believe what I did to you. I'm so sorry, will you forgive me? Her father, three years after being moved to this city, is asking his daughter for forgiveness for how he mistreated her when she was a young girl. So the woman goes on to forgive the father and then asks right there, hey, do you wanna pray a prayer of repentance and receive salvation? And the father says, yes. And then 10 days later, this woman is baptizing her father. So how do we do this? Anybody asking that? You hear a story like that? How do we get there? Number one, write it down. You gotta remember the cross, baby. Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. You need to get the picture of grace in your mind and in your heart right now. Because the cross is a reminder of what you and I deserved, but Jesus. It's a picture of the price that he paid for you and I's debt. Here's what I wrote down in my notes. You can't rehearse your hurt and remember God's grace at the same time. So when you think about the cross and what Jesus poured out, you can't rehearse your hurt and your pain because think about the pain that we caused him. He took it. He took it all and he didn't even deserve it. So we remember the cross. Number two, we gotta process our pain. For some of you, this looks like getting counseling. This looks like, man, sitting down and actually going through a process like Fresh Start. We have Fresh Start care groups. I would just challenge you in here today that if you're struggling, you need to get surrounded. You need to get around some people that can walk with you. The third thing is this, and this is probably gonna be the hardest one for us to do, but we need to pray blessing over them. You're like, what? No, I wanna pray what feels good to me. No, we need to pray the truth. Luke 6, 27, 28, but to you who are willing to listen, I say, here it is, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who hurt you. If you do what God asks you to do, he will do what you cannot do. And I wanna invite some people into a challenge. Today is February 25th. Easter is March 31st. 33 day, I'm gonna ask you to, to, to join me in a 33 day prayer challenge. How many years did Jesus live? 33 days from today is Good Friday when Jesus hung on the cross. A 33 day prayer challenge for your accuser, for the person that offended you. And if you'll commit to those 33 days, let's talk on day 34 about where your heart's at when you begin praying and blessing them in the spirit by faith. That's how we forgive. That's how we forgive. Let's go ahead and stand to our feet as we close. Because I think that there are, there's a challenge for us today as we close out today. For some of us in the room today, we need to evict the stronghold of unforgiveness. And then the rest of us in here, we need to begin exercising to become unoffendable. In Acts 24, 16, this is what Paul wrote. And why do I exercise myself? To have always a conscious void of offense towards God 
and toward men. Our culture is so, I should say this, the church is so easily offended because our spirit isn't in shape. We aren't in our word, we're not praying in the spirit and we aren't fasting. If we'll commit to those things, if we'll begin exercising in the spirit, we'll be void of offense toward God and toward men. Now, some of you are thinking, well, it's easy for you to preach this, Pastor. You, you, you probably don't struggle with this. Can I just tell you, I'm in it with you. As a matter of fact, I'm thinking this week, like, why in the world are you having me preach this? There's ah, still stuff in my own heart that I gotta deal with. Ah, I don't wanna do this. But he wants our freedom. And as I was preparing this week, I was reminded of a season in my ministry where, if I'm just really honest, Sometimes being a pastor is vulnerable. You know, you're, you're pouring your heart out, you're spending time with people, you're committing time to invest in discipling people, you're putting your heart on the line for people, and every, every once in a while you do that, and those same people that you're leading and you're sowing into and you're pouring into and you're giving your life to and you're on your knees praying for are the same people that wanna stab you in the back, that wanna run, a few years ago, I experienced this. And I just remember how my heart began to grow cold. The love of God and the fire inside of me was growing cold by the day. I found myself becoming cynical, jaded. Ministry felt more like an occupation. And honestly, when we experience offense, or at least for me, because I've experienced rejection in my life, I felt like I went into this self-preservation mode where the walls went up, I put up the fence and I became numb. And if I'm honest, I was so proud that I couldn't admit that I was offended until I read this article on Corey Ten Boom, who was a prisoner in a concentration camp during Holoc Holocaust. In 1947, I read this story. She was in a church in Munich after the war was over talking about the forgiveness of God. She said in those days when she would go and share about the forgiveness of God on the heels of something so tragic and so crazy that most people would exit the church in complete silence. And on this particular day in this church, she's sharing on the forgiveness of God, the people get up, they begin exiting. But as the sea of people are exiting, she notices a man fighting through the crowd to come towards her. And as she's looking at him, she notices his brown hat and his jacket. But then as he gets closer and closer, she begins to have flashbacks to the times that she was in concentration camp. And she begins seeing a man in a blue shirt and in a hat with, with skulls and crossbones on his hat. And she's going in and out of this picture. And she recognizes this man as one of the guards at Ravensbrück where she was, where she was being held captive. You can imagine what she must have felt as he began to approach her. You can imagine the look on her face. It's one thing to talk about forgiveness. It's another thing to actually have to walk it out. And in this moment, this guard is approaching her and the first thing out of his mouth is, I mean, isn't, isn't it, thank you for sharing that God casts our sin into the deep sea. And I wanna tell you that I've been forgiven. I gave my life to Jesus and all the, stuff that I did, I know he's forgiven, but I came up here tonight to ask you if you'll forgive me. And, she, and he stuck his hand out. And I want, I want you to, to, to hear this because this is so powerful. This is what she said in the article that just melt me, it broke me. She said this, I stood there with coldness clutching my heart and this is where some of you are today. But forgiveness is not an emotion, I knew that too. Forgiveness is an act of the will and the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. Jesus, help me, I prayed silently. I can lift my hand, I can do that much. You supply the feeling. And so woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hand into the one stretched out to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder, raced down my arm, and sprang into our joined hands. And then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bring tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, I cried. With all my heart, 
for a moment, we grasped each other's hands, the former guard and the former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did then. But even so, I realized, here it is, it was not my love. I had tried and did not have the power. It was the power of the Holy Spirit transforming me into God's love. I want to leave you with this quote. To forgive is to set a prisoner free and discover that the prisoner was you. Father, we thank you for this word. There's so much to it. And we confess even now just how hard it is to walk it out. We feel justified in our offense. And so often in this life, just like this unmerciful servant, we're choking people out saying, pay me what you owe me. And forgetting how much we've been forgiven of. So even in this moment right now, God, I pray that godly sorrow would lead to repentance. That this moment right here, we would feel the weight. We would feel the weight of our debt we would be reminded of the weight of our debt. For those of us that have been set free, would we continue to remember the price that you paid so that we could be free? God, today we release forgiveness in this place. We pray that you would do the work in our hearts. In Jesus' name. Now, before I say amen,